everybody. I'm recording uh, from my staircase today. <laughs> I can't help but think of that as sort of a funny scenario to be in. But anyhow, um, today would be our normal Monday class, so let's try to make it as close to that as much as possible. Uh, like normal, I made a, an agenda. Um, let me start with uh, talking about the calendar. Um, for what we'll be doing today and Wednesday of this week. All right. Originally scheduled, I have my, uh, my calendar that I usually keep and you have a copy of with the syllabus. Um, we should have been basically doing uh, section 5-6 today. But what I want to do is push that to next week. Right. What we'll do today is basically section 5-3 um, part one. And we'll have a little bit more time with it. And on Wednesday, we'll do section 5.3, part two. Right. As for next week, um, what should have happened next week, of course, was that we had our second test. Right. There's no way, obviously, that I can give you a test. I can't proctor it, um, and I can't collect it. <laughs> so, don't even worry about it for right now. Primarily, I'm just going to give you uh, some notes and that will be useful hopefully while you're trying the homework in uh, my lab. All right. Try to work on these two sections this week, 5-3 part 1 and 5-3 part 2. All right. Next week, all right, on the day that we would have had our test, section 5-6. Uh, we'll do that and then we're basically done with chapter 5. All right. and from that point forward, we're back on schedule then. Okay. I'll give you some reminders just before we leave as to which assignments to do and where to look. Okay, All right, let me erase this. This is basically a piece of plywood that I happen to have uh, from something to do with my air conditioner. I had to build an adapter once for my air conditioner, so I bought some plywood. And I'm so glad that I did now because now I have something to write on. Anyhow. Um, I also had a piece of acrylic plastic, which, um, although it's a little dry right now, it does work fairly well. As you can see, I put a whiteboard marker on it, and it does come off. I also have the spray, but I don't want it to get wet just yet. I'll do that later. Anyhow, as long as this is in frame, um, I'm always worried that when I record something that I my view, my perspective of the camera is a little different than the actual end result. You know, like sometimes the, the it's, it's, I don't have panoramic uh, recording capabilities, but maybe a little wider this way. So maybe I'm leaning more than I have to. It's actually backwards too. Like it's the mirror image what I'm looking at right now as I'm recording rather than what would be normal. Like I spelled the word agenda and all the letters are backwards from my perspective. Anyhow, the end result will be fine usable at least. Right. I need my glasses. Anyway, glasses on. Okay, I got my nipples here. All right. Um, keep looking in Canvas. The announcements, I'll keep posting links to the videos that I record. Um, as far as handouts are concerned, the things that I normally would give you in class, in person, uh, there's a section in uh, in our Canvas course pages that has says for chest no, test number two. So uh, last time I alluded to it as well. I said, okay, look here, these things that are orange links. I think I changed the color for the one thing that I needed now. Right. Maybe green. Let me put this aside. Okay. I'm gonna put that on the floor if I don't have to. Okay, let's see. Here is basically a rundown of the material that we have to cover. Okay. This is section 5.3, and this is about rational numbers. Right. I'm sorry for any legibility issues last time. I was kind of counting on the camera being high tech, high definition. Uh, but I think because our blackboard is normally green and I wasn't using as contrasting color chalk, I had used yellow, made it a little bit hard to see. Anyhow, 
Here's a white uh, background and a black marker. What we're going to do basically for section 5.3, as I mentioned, is part 1 and part 2. Okay. The stuff specifically today is this. Now we're going to be talking about simplifying fractions and conversions. Some of which you have the experience with this semester of converting between fractions and decimals. But um, what we're going to add to that in this section is converting from a mixed number to an improper fraction, an improper fraction back to a mixed number, and then converting um, an infinitely repeating decimal into a fraction. Let's see. Uh, later this week, we'll be doing this just operations. Uh, with fractions, so adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and also the order of operations. Please excuse my dear and Sally, I'm Das, whichever you prefer. Okay, now to get started, let me refer to a handout that I would have given you. Uh, basically, there is in Canvas Pages, again, it should be highlighted in green, a document that looks like this, a diagram for different methods for, set, uh, for simplifying fractions. Right. We had talked about rules of divisibility in the last class. There's also a handout. I listed these five because those to me are probably the easiest out of the bunch of them. And they're the most practical in this order. Like for instance, you know that you could divide by two if you have an even number. You could divide by three, again, nicely is you don't get a remainder. That means they're divisible. <clears throat> you could divide by three if the sum of the digits is also divisible by three. If two and three work, then six would be a better choice. You could divide by five. You could also divide by 10 if they ended up five or a zero in this case, or just a zero in this case. These other two methods we're gonna discuss in more detail. And I'm gonna do the same type of problem, three different ways that you could see that they will produce the same result. And what the benefit of doing it one way versus another is. There's a shortcut, but it only works for round numbers, something that has a lot of zeros in it. Let me erase this if I may. It's a little cold in my hallway, so it's not erasing as nicely or as easily. I actually have a spray, but I don't really want to get it wet. Because that will screw up my eraser. Okay. Okay. So we are doing basically simplifying fractions. Different methods, all the same fraction as an example. You had something like 12 over 16, all right? And you were going to go about it uh, via the process of divisibility rules. Right. Um, divisibility rules will work, right? It may not be the most efficient choice, but I think it's probably. If a person were confronted with this problem, the most intuitive thing, it's the thing that they would go, oh, I'll do that, you know, because they feel most comfortable. Right? They'll say, well, these two numbers are both even. That is, they end in a zero, a two, a four, or a six, or an eight. Right? This ends in a two, this ends in a six, they're both even, therefore you can divide by two nicely, meaning it's divisible, meaning no remainder. You get a remainder of zero, you might say. And go ahead and try that. Divide by 2 here, divide by 2 here. Incidentally, what makes this legal, this process, is the consistency. Right? Whatever you do to the top number, do to the bottom number. Right? As I'm often fond of saying, 
you can get away with murder in math as long as you're consistent. Whatever you do to the left side of an equation, do to the right side. Whatever you do to the top of a fraction, do to the bottom of a fraction. Consistency is what makes things legal. So 12 divided by 2 is 6. 16 divided by 2 is 8. All right. And you have reduced this fraction to something a little bit closer to being simplified, but not completely. All right. Another issue uh, when it comes to fractions is that people are not quite sure when they're done. Um, if you're going to go this route using divisibility rules, try to exhaust the method that you are using all right, until you can get it as far as you can possibly go. What I mean is if you divide it by 2 and you got some, made some progress, keep doing that until you can't anymore. All right? And remember, you have to do it with both numbers. Right? The top number and the bottom number both have to be divided by 2. If one of them only and not the other, you can't use it. All right, remember, consistency. So you would try to divide by 2 again, divide by 2 again, and it works. 6 divided by 2 is 3, and 8 divided by 2 is 4. Now at this point, if you attempted to divide by 2 yet again, it would work with 4, but it wouldn't work with 3. And so you would say, all right, this is probably in simplest form. It is, officially, and there's a rule for that. I'll get into it when we talk about GCF. But you should sort of test other numbers. Like, for instance, the next choice would be the number 3. You could divide the top by 3, but not the bottom by 3. Right? If you divide it 4 by 3, it is, in theory, you could divi it's dividable. It's not divisible, though. You would get some remainder. It wouldn't be practical to continue. Anyhow, this is finished. Right? You see what the answer is. You see what the original problem was. Let's try the same thing in a slightly more sophisticated method, GCF method. Okay. If you are going to simplify by using a greatest common factor, I have to abbreviate myself because I have very limited real estate here on the board. You would start with attempting to list the factors, and then they're in pairs, mind you, uh, numbers that multiply together that make 12, and then list also the factors of 16. Now, since we use set builder no tip, pardon me, uh, we talk about sets in this class, not set builder, but just sets. Let's use fancy braces to sort of collect them. All right. The easiest pair of factors is the number of one and whatever the uh, and itself, whatever the number is here. So, for example, one times twelve would make twelve. All right. And as you probably know, um, there's other more than just these two because it's a composite number. It's not prime. If it were prime, it would just be simply two factors only. Two times six makes twelve, and there is one other pair naturally naturally, which is three-fourths, uh, three times four, I should say. If you did 16, it'd be one and 16, two and eight, and uh, four times four, all right? When you're listing them, a question that comes up a lot is, well, do I have to write four comma four? No, as long as you are counting for it, you just have to write it once. So although this looks a little bit messy, these are all the factors that would make 16. These are all the factors that make 12. Right. If you're concerned with, well, how do you know uh, that you have all of them? All right. If the number is a, a relatively small number, like 12, it's familiar. You could get away with uh, having a lot of this information simply memorized. If you had a number that was a high double-digit number, or a, a three-digit wide number, a triple-digit number, if you will, you could use rules of divisibility, right? Because if a number is divisible by another number, then the number that of which it is divisible by is a factor. Right? For example, this is even, so it is divisible by two. Therefore, two is a factor, and then you would figure out the mysterious partner that would make the number 12. Right? It would be six in this case. Right? But I mean, like a number like 96, it's even, so you know it's got to be two times something. I want to say it's whatever the 
if you divided 96 by 2, whatever that quotient is, is your other factor would be 48, right? Anyhow, if you compare these two lists of factors, right, you'll notice a couple of things. They have more than one thing in common, right? Virtually everything has the factor 1 in common. However, if you were to choose the number 1 um, as the number you consistently divide into the top and into the bottom, you wouldn't get anywhere with it, right? If you divide it by 1 here and here, you'd be stuck with 12 and 16. So although virtually everything has that as a common factor, you want the greatest common factor, ideally. Right? These things happen to, even, happen to be even, so again, they are both made of the number 2. But if you use the number 2, as we had when we were using rules of divisibility, you'd get halfway, right? but you wouldn't go the whole 9 yards. So, no sin in making a little bit of progress, but you want to go as far as it is possible. And we're trying not to just simply rely on the visibility. We're trying to go for the greatest common factor instead. The best choice ultimately is the number four itself. If a person, you just erase this. If a person were to strategically choose to divide by the GCF, the greatest common factor, the benefit of doing that is basically you will get directly to the answer right off the bat in one step, right? And it's a guarantee, right? You won't have to fill around in the dark on, well, is this completely simplified or not? No, it will definitely be simplified if you use the greatest common factor. That's really why they encourage a student, especially in grammar school, to go this route rather than divisibility, right? This is completely simplified right, when using the GCF. As long as you know up front that you have, in fact, the GCF, then that is the best choice. 12 divided by 4 will give you 3. 16 divided by 4 will give you 4. All right, so it is done. All right. There's another way you could tell that you have a simplified fraction. All right. Let me erase this underneath here um, to show you something. It is absolutely certain, right, that a fraction is simplified when the GCF becomes 1, right? meaning that if you analyze the factors of what the end result is here, 3 and 4, and you compare these, what you'll notice is that now, completely simplified, the GCF is 1. I'm sorry, this is out of frame. Let me put this down just a hint here. I don't want to break my camera. But you can see that. When the GCF is no greater than 1, as it would be in the end result here, you could say with certitude this is completely simplified. If you use the GCF, as in the last problem, just to reiterate, from the beginning, then you're guaranteed in one shot that you will get to the, the end result, not multiple steps, right? That is the difference really between using GCF and using divisibility rules. Divisibility rules are good, especially if you're feeling around in the dark, but it might take several steps to get to the answer, and even then a person may be a little uh, unsure. Okay. All right, now the last method it's going to be the same problem, so you know what the end result should be, is to use prime factorizations. Okay. If 
you use prime factorizations. Remember from last time, um, there's two ways to go about obtaining the prime factorization. You could use factor trees, or you can use that thing that I can only best describe by the way it looks, upside down division by prime numbers to get the prime factorizations. The thing is you will have to do it for two numbers, the numerator and the denominator, the top and the bottom of the fraction respectively. This, although it's maybe the most tedious way of doing it, it takes time, it's uh, kind of satisfying at the end. You'll see what I mean as we do it. Let's get the prime factorizations of 12 and 16 first. These are our original fraction, 12, 16. And I'll just simply make trees in this case. All right. If you can conceive of two numbers not using one, all right, that multiply together, that make the number 12, right? whether you start with two and six or you start with three and four is fine. Right? The end result will be exclusively prime numbers. In order to be truly a prime factorization, the bottom rung of the tree has to be prime numbers only. Another thing to remember from last time is, well, what are prime numbers? I'll just draw them here. It's good to have some of this memorized. A prime number by definition has exclusively two factors, one and itself. So famously, two is a prime number, three is a prime number, five, seven, 11, 13. You can't possibly memorize them all, but it is still good to know these by part. Anyhow, let's say that you went with the choice of uh, three and four, all right? You would stop branching out like this when you have a prime number, and you would continue branching out if you don't have a prime number, if you have, namely, a composite something that has more than two factors is a composite by definition. Three is prime, right? It only has two factors, one in itself. It's like two has only two factors, one in itself, and five only has two factors, one in itself. Well, three would be fine, but four isn't, right? Four is a composite, it has more than two factors, so you would continue, right? Two times two would make four. I'm just gonna drag down three so that it's on the same level here. This is a little messed up. This end result here, I'm going to use multiplication dots, is the prime factorization of 12 specifically. If you multiplied all of these together, you would get the original number. Let's do the same thing for 16. If you were to list, uh, pardon me, uh, factor 16, not wrong if you use 4 by 4, and it's not wrong if you use 2 times 8. All right? The end results will be the same, all right? as long as you strategically look for prime numbers at the end, right? Making sure. Let's go with um, four times four, just for the sake of space. Neither of these factors is prime, they're composite, but I know that I can factor them further, specifically into two times two. And now you have this. Okay. Now, in the last section, when we were trying to decide what the GCF was, the added, the added step I would have recommended in that sort of flow chart that I gave you last time was to use abbreviations. In other words, when you see uh, two iterations of the number two, use a, an exponent of two to represent two iterations, two clones, if you will. And over here, you would do two to the fourth is this four twos, right? It isn't necessary in this case because we're not looking to find what the GCF is. That's a different method we've already discussed. What we're doing is we're gonna take the end results here and we're gonna write them next to the fractions 12 and 16. And then we're gonna do a satisfying thing. I am going to erase just this much for the moment and list these in sort of descending order. So if the prime factorization of 12 is three times two times two, that's this thing in red, 
and I will put it on, on top. And if the prime factorization of 16, I will write it here next to it. I'm going to strategically sort of align these two, right? There's not, nothing wrong with certainly just starting with your writing here, but I want to show you something that is kind of nice if you, you have the foresight. I'm going to take these four twos and align them with the twos above them. Two dot two dot two dot two multiplication dots. Okay, now here's where it gets kind of, satis kind of satisfying. All right, what you will do if you choose to go this route is cross out pairs of like factors. Certainly, I'm sorry if there's an echo because I'm in a hallway, so there's only hard surfaces here. It would be fun if I started hanging up carpet and stuff like that. My landlord would kill me. Anyhow, um, what you could, what you'll notice now to be focused is that there is a pair of twos, which I can now cross out, and then a second pair of twos, coincidentally. And then there's the leftovers, right? What is left over is the answer. Uh, is the simplified fraction in this case. So if we just have a three left over, that is the top number. And if you have twos, two, two twos left over on the bottom, compile them back together, multiply them. Two times two is four. And you get to the same answer. Now, granted, you might say to yourself, that's a lot of trouble for something that I could have done a lot faster. Just save it in the back of your head, all right, as with any of these methods, all right? It's just sort of nice to know that there is more than one way to do something. This is often the case in there, there is more than one way to do something. So be open-minded about the possibility. This kind of a method, using the prime factorizations for the purpose of simplifying, is handy if in a world where we have no calculators, all right, or we have very, very large numbers, right, something that is less familiar than the number 12 and 16. Like if you had, for example, 48 over 96, right? 48 has a lot of factors, 96 has a lot of factors. Even to figure out the factors right, would be kind of tedious because then you would really be dependent upon whatever you have memorized products. Um, multiplication tables and rules of divisibility. Anyhow, perhaps I will do that since I brought it up. When you have something that is unfamiliar or a little bit more complicated than 12 over 16, Say, for example, if you had 48 over 96, right, two numbers that are somewhat outside the realm of the familiar, you could attempt to list the factors looking for the GCF, but it will take just some time, just as much time, really, because you're going to use rules of divisibility also. Or you could just, you know, keep dividing by two, and it will take several steps to get to the answer. Let me show you a prime factorization. Uh, method for this, uh, just for argument's sake. Okay. If we went about using factor trees in the last case, let me try the alternative method, which is upside down division by primes. Okay, sorry for the sloppiness. Upside down division by primes says start with the lowest prime number. Sorry for the squeaking. Start with the lowest prime number that is divisible. Remember, Almost everything is dividable, but not everything is divisible. Okay. In other words, 
start with the lowest prime number, namely two, if it works. And if it does work, keep using it until it can't work anymore. Exhausted. So 48 is an even number. It is therefore divisible by two. So I will divide this by two. This is again, trying to get the prime factorization, but using upside down division by primes. Instead of factor trees. Two goes into four exactly twice. Right? The difference would be zero. Two goes into eight exactly four times. The difference would be zero. All right. Now, if you're wondering, okay, that's great, but uh, how do you know when to stop? You stop when you have a prime number, when the quotient is prime. If the whole objective here is to obtain the prime factorizations, we can't have something that isn't. So again, I'm gonna keep using two until I can't anymore, all right? Two goes into itself once, two goes into four twice, all right? This is making progress, but it's still divisible by two, so I'm gonna keep going. Two does not go into one, it's too big, all right? But two goes into 12 exactly six times, all right? I could still use two, all right? And two goes into six exactly thrice, all right? Anyhow. I stop when I have a quotient that is also prime. All of this junk that you see sitting on the end here, this is the prime factorization of the number 48. I'm going to do something similar with 96. Again, you start with the lowest prime that is divisible. So 2 would work. Yeah, let's use blue. No, it's not going to be contrasting. Let's again. Okay. Two goes into nine, uh, roughly four times, which is eight. The difference is one. I'm using short division here. The difference is one, so I'm going to squeak a little one in here and read this as 16. Two goes into 16 exactly eight times. And we want to notice something. Hmm, this is suspiciously familiar. Keep going. All right. Use two again. Two goes into four. Uh, twice goes into eight, four times. Keep going with two until you can't anymore. All right. Two goes into itself once, goes into four twice. Um, two goes into the six times. Two goes into that three times. Okay, and you stop ultimately when you hit a prime number. All right, that's the quotient. This on the edge here is the prime factorization of 96. Right. Now, because I'm a little concerned about erasing my work and forgetting something, I'm just going to erase this. If you were to take these and rewrite them adjacent, the prime factorization of 48, I'm going to put them in numerical order descending see this. Here is three and then one, two, three, four, twos. Two dot two dot two dot two. And then the same thing. I'll do these threes here and twos as well. Three dot two dot two dot two dot two and then that happens to be an extra one. Now again you have the satisfaction of crossing out pairs. It's unfortunately I'm running out of uh, board space here. It's out of frame. Just uh, cross out the things that match. There's a pair of threes that match. There's a pair of twos. Another one. Another one. Another one. All right. What is the only thing left over on the bottom? Two. There isn't anything left over on top. But these cross outs are really as if you divided these two things. I'm just not consciously thinking about it. Anyhow, what's something divided by itself for the most part, zero being the exception? One. So on top, I would just have one. That means, although this is perhaps an intimidating fraction, 48 over 96, it really is one half by another name. It's disguised, if you will. You can see the benefit of doing this. Now let's 
get into conversion. number has a whole number and then a fraction next to it next to it a numerator sitting on top of a denominator okay so one very large number sitting here and then a fraction sitting adjacent to it. For example, three and a half is an example of a mixed number. At the same time, what is an improper fraction? An improper fraction technically is this situation. Um, most obvious it is a larger numerator and a smaller denominator. The truth is even if you had something like 7 over 7 that is technically an improper fraction as well. Your textbook doesn't think so for some reason but I, I've read many textbooks and they all seem to say this Right? It's either larger on top or exactly equal to the denominator. So I suppose it really doesn't matter. It's, but I would classify a number sitting on top of itself as being improper as well. This is more or less the usual situation that you get. So if you had something like 7 over 6, right? you have a larger top and a smaller bottom. Sorry if this is out of frame. This is a 6. Yeah, put it over here. 7 over 6. Both of these, but especially this, all right, should be considered improper. And incidentally, just for the sake of clarity, the top should be a numerator, the bottom should be a denominator, at least in English. I think it's easier for people to understand top, bottom. Okay. More universally understood. Or I should say it is universally understood. Okay, now as for a process, if you're going to convert from a mixed number to an improper fraction, I would do it like this. Whatever the whole is, and then you have your numerator and your denominator here. Sort of a flow of traffic, if you will. This times this added to this. So for example, if you had from before, three and a half. If you did 3 times 2, you would get 6, right? And if you added 6 to the top, this produces 7, right? And then you keep the same denominator. 7 over 2 would be your answer. Here's another one. I'll put it next to it. If 
you had, uh, say hypothetically, I'm gonna get it in too much trouble here. If you had four and seven eighths, you would multiply these two. Four times eight is 32. 32 plus seven is 39. That is your new numerator, for lack of a better phrase. And what you divide it by, you keep the same denominator. Right. Always keep the same denominator. Okay. Let's say that you are going the other way. Let's say that you're starting with an improper fraction and you're converting that to the next number. Um, in its most basic form of the instruction, it is the top divided by the bottom. Right. I should, if I were a good guy, use the proper terminology, but I think this is more intu intuitive. Right. Everybody knows what a top is and everybody knows what a bottom is. All right. Officially, I should say this. The numerator divided by the denominator. As Tim Allen once famously said, that sounds like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. I am the denominator, you know. Yeah. Bad jokes. Okay. The denominator, um, yeah. Anyhow, when you're given a problem, Let's say that you're given um, something like this, 8 over 5. All right, I have found that it's useful to simply either write on top of your, your textbook, as long as you own it, or if you have it printed out, um, and draw a little division box next to it, like this. All right, because that already has the 5 then, which is the bottom or the denominator in its appropriate place. Right? If you're dividing the top by the bottom, then it is essentially the, the dividend divided by the divisor. And the divisor is the number that is sitting on the outside, naturally. The dividend being the thing on the inside. Just sort of, just have to sort of adjust to this. Whatever is on top goes in the box. Now I did intuitively put a dot here, but we're not really converting to a decimal. Um, but that's where the number ends. So I sort of put that period there like the end of the sentence to finalize it. Right. Anyhow, you talk yourself through the process. You say five uh, goes into eight, how many times, right? How many fives can I squeeze into eight roughly? No more than one, right? I should say correct. And then whatever these two things multiplied is what goes here, right? One times five is five. And then you do the subtraction, naturally. So if you subtracted eight and five, you would get three. If this was decimal division, and you'll see again later, you would put a zero here, sure, drag it down and go through the process again. But we're making fractions, or we're making mixed numbers specifically. So I, this is my remainder. So what do you do with the remainder? The remainder gets written here. And just as in the instance before, you always keep the denominator, you do it in this instance. Sorry for the mess. But whatever you're dividing by, that continues to be your denominator. So what is 8 fifths? Eight fifths an improper fraction in the style of a mixed number is one whole, right, and three fifths.
divide the top by the bottom, the remainder becomes your new numerator. The remainder is equal to the top of the fraction. Right. Whereas, whatever you divide it by, that is your bottom. Your denominator of your fraction. So if you see a 5 here, put a 5 as the new denominator. Sorry if it's a little faint. Yeah, let me put this in frame. Whatever you divide by, that is equal to the bottom of the fraction. This is your denominator. If you see a 5 here, you put a 5 here. Anyway, let's do a worse one. A more complicated problem. So let's say hypothetically you had 225 sitting on top of it. That is definitely improper. Big head, little body, right? Big top, little bottom. Draw your box adjacent. The A is already in the position it's supposed to be in, the divisor position. And stop, drop, and roll your 225 in here. And then go about the process of dividing, right? How many eighths can you fit in two? It's too big, you move on, right? How many eighths can you squeeze into 22, right? Roughly two, which itself would be 16. This number, the quotient times the divisor, is what goes here, always, right? So 16, uh, pardon me, 20. 22 divided by 16 is, let's see, 6, right? Here's proof. That's 12. This would become 1. This is 6. All right, drag down 5. Let me use a different color. This green never writes. Uh, Eight goes into 65, roughly. Uh, let's see, eight times eight is 64. That's probably as close as you're gonna get without overshooting it. So you would say, okay, eight. And then again, whatever number is here, eight times eight is what goes here, 64. And you subtract, just as you subtracted before. And the difference is one. All right. It's out of frame again, let me pull this down. Okay. Okay, that one, is your remainder, of course, because we're not doing decimal division quite yet. So one is your new numerator, your new top. What you divide it by, you always keep the same denominator, eight. So although it's very sloppy, let me rewrite it. What is 22, uh, pardon me, 225 over eight? It's 28 and 1 eighth, apparently. Okay. When you're doing division by hand, and I can't stress this enough, especially if you're going to the profession of teaching, it helps to have some frame of reference. Although they sort of uh, teach us to not, you know, get the students to, to memorize fundamental facts, that's really hobbling them. If they don't have fundamental facts, Memorized. If they don't know their multiplication tables, it makes naturally doing uh, division di very, very difficult. They need the frame of reference, so don't ever feel bad. In spite of what anybody tells you, all right, memorization, especially for a child, is imperative, all right, from the age of eight or maybe even younger, eight on up, all right, through grammar school. They need to memorize fundamental facts. They need a frame of reference. In order to do division, you need to know the opposite of division, which is multiplication. Okay. Let me erase this. Okay. Okay. Let's see. All right. Next.
next thing is we're going to sort of review uh, converting a fraction to a decimal. Now, uh, just to remind you, we have sort of broached the subject before. And I'm going to dig for it just to point at it. But a while ago, um, I'm going to say it was last chapter, this came up. So let me just refer to a diagram that you already have to give you some inkling as to what we're going to do. Sorry, bear with me. like this um, in PowerPoint. This was the original drawing that I had done. This is my schematic, if you will. Um, anyhow, you should have a diagram that basically talks about converting between fractions, decimals, and percents. All right? It's this sort of frat zog, um, Roy Lowe triangle diagram. That information is still useful um, because we're still going to be talking about that process. Okay. Anyhow, um, let me refer to another diagram first. There is also more recently a diagram that looks like this that is still available, and again, uh, and again, uh, Canvas pages. A numbers family tree. Uh, I'm going to draw it here because I, unfortunately I don't have a projector, so I can't. I uh, rely on that. But right, you have this diagram. Okay. Um, in the family of numbers, there are famously the real numbers. And then there is this other category, the imaginary numbers. Right, the imaginary numbers are not really relevant right now. All right, but what are imaginary numbers in general? When you have a negative under a square root, this produces a negative, uh, an imaginary number. Anyhow, the instructions that we normally get, especially in grammar school math, uh, elementary education, is that they say, ah, oh, find all the real numbers, which I, I always hated that, because I'm like, why, why do you call it that? You know, it's because there's this other category, apparently. They never br uh, bring up the imaginary numbers in, in fifth grade, right? But uh, the real numbers are this separate category. Anyhow, of real numbers, there are famously rational numbers and irrational numbers. Okay. And how you could distinguish these immediately is like so. Anything that can be a fraction is rational. It has even the, uh, the root ratio in it, which is just a way of saying one number on top of another number. All right. Anyhow, if something, even if it doesn't start out that way, it's disguised. If it can be written in the style of a fraction, it's rational. If something can't be, a fraction, then it is irrational. All right. And there's famously pi is the first irrational number that children are normally introduced to. 3.14159, whatever it is, into infinity. All right, there's other famous superstars, if you will, of math. I like that phrase, I stole that, I have to admit. That's another math person I've come across. They refer to pi and e and i as the superstars of math. I thought that was charming. Anyhow, they are, they're famous numbers. Pi is the first famous number that you're taught when you're a kid. 
right? Anyhow, pi cannot be written in the style of a fraction, right? Okay. Why? Well, I'm running out of space, so I have to unfortunately erase my diagram and continue with it a little bit lower. But again, if you have the handout, right, of this diagram that you have, it was from a couple of weeks ago, right? You could doodle on it, right, as we're going through this. Me just sort of replicate this lower half a little bit higher up. Of things that are rational, there are two subcategories even further still. There are the integers. And then there are decimals, which is relevant for us now. Right. There's two types of decimals, though. Right. There are terminating decimals. And then there are repeating decimals. If these things are all under the category of being rational and therefore can be a, f a fraction, right? here is some examples of each. Right? Remember, an integer is really a whole number. Right? It could be a negative whole number, it can be zero, or it can be a positive, but they're all whole numbers. Right? Even if you started out with, um, let's see, Use green reluctantly. Even if you had the number three, right, it's a whole number, it would technically be a positive three, and therefore it's an integer, so it's of this subcategory. Even this can be disguised to look like a fraction. How? By sticking a one under it, right? If you treat this as a little teeny tiny division problem, and every fraction really is, three divided by one is still three, right? It doesn't change the value of it, just making it look that way. Terminating decimals can also be written in the style of a fraction. Right? For example, if you had 0 0.3, I'm kind of jumping the gun here a little bit, but just to give you an example for reference later, when you're converting a terminating decimal to a fraction, you're basically acknowledging the place value that the last digit, the far right digit, namely this three, is sitting in, right? Three is sitting in the tenths place, so you would use a denominator of 10, and then you would just simply take this number and not use zero on the decimal point. So point three, in um, a fancy way of speaking about the number, rather than saying point three, but saying it with its suffix THS, would be three tenths, right? Correct, I could say. English, remember, as I'm fond of saying, gets you in trouble right, when you're teaching math. Right? But three tenths right, is another way of saying 0 0.3. And, and saying that way kind of helps you, talking that way kind of helps you when you're trying to figure out what the equivalent is. Right? Anyhow, even a terminating decimal can be written in the style of a fraction, therefore it's, it's rational. Famously, and this is really the subject of today, when you have a repeater, so if you had hypothetically 0 0.3 repeating, and they'll usually abbreviate that with a little bar written above the 3, bar notation. Right? Bar notation is essentially an abbreviation for repeaters. So if you see a bar sitting over just the number three, that means that this is really 0 0.333 forever and ever and ever. I'll use these ellipses as well to indicate that. All right? Even that, something that has a pattern to it, is considered rational because it does in fact come from a fraction. This comes from the fraction one-third. Right? 
there's a method that we have to discuss of starting with the pardon me, starting with the decimal and converting to the fraction. We're going to discuss a little bit later today, but later. Right now, this is just more or less an overview of the rational numbers. As far as uh, conversion is concerned, we're still doing this. We're still going to divide the top by the bottom, right? as in the process of converting an improper fraction to a mixed number. This was the instruction, and it's still the instruction, even though we're converting to a decimal. I'm just going to tweak it slightly. this. If you had three-fifths, right. this isn't improper per se, it's a regular ordinary fraction because there is evidently a smaller number on top. There is a smaller numerator than there is a denominator. But if I still follow this process, draw the box adjacent to the denominator, the bottom, and then just plop this three inside here. I'm going to strategically put a decimal point and then maybe start out with some zeros. You may not end up needing all of them, but just to get you rolling. Uh -huh. Anyhow, and then you would sort of uh, talk yourself through the process. All right? Five does not fit into three, it's too small. All right? But in this case, we're going to fill the void. Now we're going to purposely put a decimal point here, and we're going to put a decimal point just above it as well. This is another example of why I had said a while back, we should use graph paper when we teach kids about doing this by hand, because the, the sort of scaffolding that graph paper really is helps them, you know, be neat, all right? And neatness helps certainly when you're doing a calculation by hand. Again, not to go off on a tangent, I feel that if we give children special paper to teach them how to form letters like this, all right, then we should give them graph paper all right, to help them anal retentively uh, perform their calculations. It is good to be very um, precise when you're doing math. All right, anyhow, we have this rig to go. Five does not fit into three. But we're not just going to ignore it, we're going to just fill the void, right, with a zero just above it. Now instead we will read this as 30. 5 goes into 30 exactly 6 times. 6 times 5 is 30. You subtract them, you get 0 here. This is the remainder. And therefore, these extra zeros were not necessary. I never feel bad about throwing zeros here because it's not changing the value or anything, and it just sort of gets you in the right direction, gets you going. All right. Anyhow, point six. Okay. Um, let's do another one. Let's do one that isn't proper to begin with. We had done, uh, let's see, before, uh, hmm. eight and five eights. Right. Eh, that's gonna end up being too similar. Let me show you this. I want something that's a little bit longer, not too arduous, but um, it'll give you more satisfaction if you see it in, in several steps, you know, the same problem. Uh, let's see. 
Let's do this. Let's do two and three eighths. Right? Since in the United States, you know, we still use the imperial system of units for measuring, right? Something like this, three eighths, you know, of a cup, or uh, three eighths of an inch. Sometimes more practical than always in a decimal form, right? Even though the metric system would be more efficient, right? We still have this situation. So. When you're dealing with a mixed number, this isn't so much a fraction as it is a mixed number because it has the big two here, right? I would still do the same process, right? Don't involve the two if you don't need it, right? Just draw the division box adjacent, right? Do drop this three in here, put a decimal point, decimal point, and ideally on graph paper, just to make it easier to work. And throw in some zeros. You may not end up needing them right immediately. Um, and go about the process. You're going to figure out what just the fraction portion of this is in terms of a decimal. And then as an afterthought, just tack the two into this position here. Right. Don't worry about the whole number until dead last. You could convert this to an improper fraction if you wanted to first. All right? But that's more trouble than it's worth. So, anyhow, 8 does not fit into 3, it's too small, we don't ignore it, we just fill the void, and you read this as 30 naturally. 8, how many 8s can you fit into 30 roughly? 3, 8 times 3 is 24, and then you subtract, right? The difference of 30 and 24 is 6, right? Here's proof of that, you would borrow from 3 and it becomes 2, 2 is a 0, put a 0 here if you like, 10 divided, pardon me, 10 minus 4 is 6. When you got it down here, right, you would continue with an extra zero. Okay. And you um, readdress the question. Right? How many eights can you squeeze into 60 roughly? If you know your multiplication tables, you have the frame of reference. Seven, all right? Eight times seven is 56. Right. The difference of 60 and 56 is 4. Right. Here is the proof. This is really 10, and therefore this is really 5. 5 is uh, 0. 10 minus 6 is 4 again. Right. Same relationship, different arrangement here. And you do another 0, bring it down. And you address the question once again. 8 goes into 40. How many 8s? That's right. How many eights can you squeeze into 40? Exactly five, right? So there we have five here. Five times eight is 40, which you would write here. And it terminates. And I'm sorry for this being out of frame. I'm just gonna try to adjust this slightly. All right, I'm gonna break my camera. Anyhow, what you're missing here is this. 40 minus 40 is zero. When you have finally struck mathematical gold and got a zero down at the bottom here, through all of your work, right, then you're done, right? You're finished. Which means that it terminates. It terminates when you have a remainder of zero. Anyhow, the 3 eighths portion of this is 0.375. So therefore, if you wanted to convert this mixed number, you would just simply put the 2 here, and it becomes 2.375, right? Or if you want to get really fancy, you can say 2 and 375 thousandths, right? Tens, hundred, thousandths place. Yay. Let me show you something that is even more interesting than this. A situation when you have a repeater, a repeating decimal. Now, we 
had talked about this before. All right. Of real numbers, there are these two subcategories. The rational numbers, which is what we've been talking about exclusively to this point, and then this other category, which is the irrational numbers. This section 5.3 is specifically about these, but it is worthwhile mentioning this. Right? I already said, if something qualifies as being rational, it can be a fraction. Right? And therefore, something that is irrational can't be a fraction. And a famous example of an irrational number is pi. Right, the Greek character for P. Right? When you were a little kid right, and they first bring up the subject of pi, they usually say, just not to get into any complicated discussion, oh, pi represents this, 3.14. They don't mention usually that there's extra digits after this. Right? And as you go through uh, math, your adult life, especially if you're in upper level math, they start to add, what well, seemingly add, the digits to this, 3.14159. Right? That's as much as I personally have memorized. Right? Why did they tell you when you were a kid that pi terminates here when in fact it doesn't? It goes on forever and ever and ever. Right? Why is it that they only give you just the first couple of digits? Because if you're a little kid and you're multiplying, multiplying two extra digits is problematic enough, right? Without having to get into the discussion of infinity. Anyhow, numbers that qualify as irrational can be decimals, certainly, but they're decimals of this sort, right? These are non-terminating, which means they go on forever and ever and ever, and simultaneously non-repeating, which means that they have no perceptible pattern to them. All right? Notice that it's 3.14159 and then something after it. All right? If you were going to try to use the entirety of pi, all right, it would be a futile effort because you can't multiply for the rest of your life. You'd never finish, all right, even if you did do it for the rest of your life. Anyhow, they kind of lie to you when you're a little kid. They say, ah, like when they're teaching areas of circles or, or, or circumferences. They'll say, hey, kid, um, don't, if you have a decimal, use 3.14 for practical reasons. But they say, but if they give you fractions, kid, uh, imagine me smoking a cigar or something. Hey, uh, you yeah. know. Like I'm a, some kind of like a mogul or something. They would say, uh, why don't you use this instead? 22 over 7. Right? The truth is, although 22 over 7 is again practical, all right, you could see by its very nature that it is in fact a fraction. All right? It's improbable because it has a big top and a little bottom by comparison. All right? But the truth is, these are not the same thing. They are not equal, right? And I'm gonna basically explore that as we divide 22 by seven, as we convert this fraction into a decimal. You'll see that they have a disparity after a certain point. All right. If you were to convert 22 over 7 into a decimal, I'm going to draw the division box. I'm going to slip 22 in here and throw some zeros in. And we'll get going. Let's see. 7 doesn't fit into 2, it's too small. Two. 7 goes into 21 roughly three times, which is 21, and the difference is 1, right? And then again, you would pull down a 0 here, and you would 
address the question again. How many sevens can you squeeze into 10? Roughly one, which is seven itself, and the difference is three. And you would bring this zero down here, and now you would read it as seven into 30. Right? How many sevens can you squeeze into 30, roughly? Four, right, which is 28. Four, um, the difference of 30 and 28 is two, all right? Before I continue, you'll go, well, that's, that's looking an awful lot like pi, and it is, up to that point, all right? If you drag down another zero, and you do it again, seven, how many sevens can you fit into 20? You could fit in two, which is 14. And again, this is out of frame, but if you have 20 minus 14, what's the difference? Six, right? I'll put it over here. Six. All right. If I add a zero, the next zero, and the zero would be dropped in here, you would then go, okay, seven goes into 60, um, roughly eight times, which is 56, and the difference would be four, and you would keep going until hopefully it terminates or there is some kind of a pattern here. Well, no pattern yet, and it certainly hasn't terminated because there's no zero down here in the subtraction. So you would add another zero, drag it down, and you will go, oh, okay. How many sevens can you squeeze into 40? Roughly five, which is 35, and the difference is coincidentally five. And you go, mm -mm. great, keep going, add another zero, drag it down. Now you have. 7 into 50. How many 7s can you squeeze into 50, roughly? 7, which is 49, and the difference would be 1. And here's where it gets interesting. The remainder here, well, the difference here would be 1. We've seen this number before. It was in the very, very beginning. Right? And it's no, no harm in running it again, you know. But look what you have. Seven would then have to go into 10, all right? This is something that we've already done. And well, it's not gonna change. The relationship between this number and this number is still that you can only fit one seven into the number 10. So you would have the number one show up in the quotient again. It just so happens that this fraction, which is 22 over seven, is an incredibly long repeating decimal. Which means that we could use bar notation if we wanted to abbreviate the answer, right? If in fact it would be one again, then it would be four again, then it would be two again, and then eight again, and then five again, and then seven again, and it would continue, right? Forever and ever and ever. We would use bar notation, and we would slip the bar over all the these digits from here to here. 3.142857, 142857, 142857, into infinity, right? That is why, although 22 over seven is remarkably close to pi, it's close but no cigar. Here is actual pi, for reference. to slip it underneath it. Actual pi, as much as we have calculated. Um, well, not me personally, but one, four, one, five, nine, something after it. You can see the difference. After the hundredths place, they cease to have any consistency. All right, it's one here instead of two. It's five here instead of eight, all right, and so forth. This actual pi, has no pattern, right? And is infinite. Right? Therefore, it is of this other category. Actual pi is irrational. An incredibly long repeater, even an incredibly long repeater, like 22 over 7, is rational. Why? because it came from a fraction, right? 
anything that comes from a fraction, even if it doesn't terminate, even if it does go on into infinity, will have some pattern to it. Anyhow, don't lie to your students <laughs> when you teach kids who are, you know, eight years old. Right? Don't go, hey, 22 over 7 is pi. No, just tell them it's very close. Right? It's very, very close. And it's practical. Right? When you have a, a, some sort of circumference problem or some area of a circle problem and you have to use pi, right? if they give you measurements that are in the style of a fraction, then using 22 over 7 would, would be a good choice. Right? If they give you decimals, then using 3.14 would be a good choice. Right? But the reality is, to a math purist, they're not the same thing exactly. Okay. I am not a purist. basic trick to this is this process. You want to make something look like a fraction, naturally, you need this line. All decimal numbers would go above the line. And whether you have improper or proper work either way. Right. Just don't include the decimal point. Just ditch the decimal point. And then in the denominator, just write the place value of the far right digit. example, if you had, and the far right digit naturally would be as far to the right that way as you could possibly read, right? So if you had 0 0.475, right? You would definitely need to bring up the conversation again about place values and know them and encourage your students to know them too. Right? Let me refer to some handout. Uh, again, that I gave you a while back. Let's see. Uh, we made this together. Right. A diagram by hand. It's overkill, this diagram, but uh, a list of all place values to know in, in English, at least. This is how you would say these things. Right? The style in America is always to use commas on the left side of the decimal point, but strangely not on the right side. Right. Um, a good textbook, all right, for the sake of clarity, should group things in sets of three and leave an obvious space. Right. The truth is, if you're teaching students that are about the age of eight, they're not going to need to really know this much this way or this much this way. They'll probably need to know tenths, hundredths, hundredths, thousandths, maybe ten thousandths. All right. The state of New Jersey has mandated that, you know, up to a certain age, you would need to know as far as the millions this way, and maybe the billions this way. Anyhow, for our purposes right now, just know in basically this range, from a hundred up to the decimal point, and to the thousandths past the decimal point. There's also a, 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 a nicer printout in Canvas pages that is the, the, the place values. Anyhow, if I take all of these digits, right, I could exclude zero because zero is unnecessary, and the decimal point, and write them above the line, it would be 475, actually, right? What is the place value of the very far right, rightmost digit? In other words, what is the location 
of this five. Well, if this is 0.4, and this is the tenths place, and if this is a seven that follows it, this is the hundredths place, and this five is sitting in the thousandths place, THS suffix. So you would write 1,000 down here. All right, to make it a little bit more clear, let me duplicate this without the mess. Four, seven, five, sitting on top of a thousand, at least to get started. All right, 475 thousandths is how you would say it, in English at least. All right, now what you should do is simplify if possible. I'll reduce this to um, the essential, right? Same value overall, but smaller numbers. Right? Usually a person would gravitate towards their calculator at this point and go, eh, just type this in. Um, if you have a scientific calculator, you can reduce fractions, right? Anyhow, I'm just gonna do this by using divisibility, all right? All right. Um, this ends at a five, this ends at a zero. You can definitely use five. It turns out that if you think about this a little bit more in terms of money, right, that uh, you, you can get away with using 25, right, which is basically five twice, right, five times five. Um, that's probably the GCF, actually, yes, right. If we took the time to calculate what the GCF is, it would, in fact, be 25. And as long as I consistently divide the top and the bottom, the numerator and the denominator, by the same thing, I will get to the simplified fraction in one shot versus several steps. Right. 25, how many could you fit into 47? One. All right. The difference of 47, I'm going to cheat over here, I'll write my work. 47 and 25 is 2, it is 22. Yep, 22. And I'm going to squeak in a little 22 here, short division, if you will. If you think about this as being $2.25 and you're dividing by a quarter, 25, how many quarters fit into $2.25? Nine quarters. So it would be 19 on top. If this was just 100, all right, how many quarters fit into 100? Four, right? And then you have an extra zero. 1940ths apparently is the same decimal as 475 thousandths. I hate saying that, but thousands, thousands, all right, da, 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 da. all right, THS, 0.475, all right, 475 thousands is the same as 1940, 1940s. Okay. Okay. Now for that other interesting case. Um, when you're converting a repeating decimal to a fraction, this is actually, I really like teaching this because it, it is very interesting, the process you will see. repeating decimal to a fraction. All right, there is some prerequisite information. Let me list this first. That would be very good to know. Prerequisite knowledge. Number one, all right? Um, this is gonna involve algebra, this process. Right? And you know that when you solve algebraically, What are you ending up going for? What are you going to end up doing? And when you solve algebraically, you're going to basically perform opposite operations. You perform opposite operations. That means that if you see something as being added, then you're going to subtract. If you see something as being multiplied, then you're going to end up dividing. Okay. 
really, you won't need any know any more algebra than that, all right? But you can end up dividing when you see something being multiplied and vice versa. Okay. Um, another piece of information that would be good to know. Um, two, all right? Know your place values. Um, especially you know, the tenths place, the hundredths place, the thousandths, right? uh, also the ones place. This is at a frame, so. No, the tenths, no, the hundreds, no, the thousands, and definitely no, the ones place. So, for example, I'll just put this here above it. If something, a decimal number, is sitting in the tenths place, then it would be something like this. There'd be a number sitting in that location, just right at the decimal point. Right? If something is sitting in the hundreds place, there would be a number sitting here, two spaces after the decimal point. And if something is in the thousands, it would be three spaces after the decimal point. And if something is in the ones place, it would be sitting here on the left side. Okay. Knowing just about those four uh, will get you pretty far. Last thing. It's a little mental math skill, but it's good to know. Okay. Um, yeah, three, just because I'm running out of space. Um, remember that when you multiply by 10, it moves the decimal point. I'm going to just draw a decimal like that. All right, once for the right. All right. Similarly, if you multiply by 100, it moves the decimal point twice towards the right. And if you multiply by 1,000, it moves the decimal point thrice, which is three times towards the right. I'll get out of the way of the camera. Okay. Right. Times 10, one place, you move that way. Times 100, two zeros, twice, you move that way. Uh, times 1,000, move the decimal point three times, thrice, you might say, uh, that way. Okay. Knowing those three things, a little bit of basic algebra. All right. Place value, locate the names of the location of a digit. And this mental math skill that multiplying accomplishes this task, uh, these tasks, all right, will be all that you need to know in order to convert a repeating decimal to a fraction. You have to use algebra really to accomplish this. At least as far as I know. Maybe there's some other way. I shouldn't rule that out. But this is the way that I have been taught myself, and I will propagate this. Till we get something better. Okay, let me give you a couple of examples, and this will be the last thing for today. Okay. If we'll take a familiar thing, a number like <clears throat> zero point three repeating. Good to know that this is really the fraction. We know that this is one third already, right? But the question is, how do you get this, all right? If you were gonna pull the earlier technique, which is to go, well, if I did this, if I said, well, this is really a three sitting in the tenths place, because that's the location of the three, all right? It wouldn't actually be correct. This is equal to 0 0.3 terminating. No bar notation. Right? Notice there's no hat up here. Right? This is not the same thing 
All right, we can't get away with simply labeling the denominator by the place value. All right. So we have to employ the technique of algebra. Cannot, cannot stress this enough. With the bar notation, that is repeating, right? It is not terminating, which is actually what three tenths is, point three. So, I'll do something different. Okay. We're gonna, this is maybe a little alien, but um, we're gonna take this number, right? And we're gonna call it N, capital N. And then we're going to basically write out um, three um, iterations of whatever is repeating. Just to see, just to illustrate the pattern. So I'm gonna call this N as 0 0.333, and I'm gonna put some ellipses to go, that's the pattern. It's gonna be threes into infinity, okay. What we wanna do is essentially two things. One, preserve some portion of this while also eliminating infinity. I want to erase infinity. I want to get cancel out basically infinity. And the way that we're going to do that is basically either by multiplying by 10, multiplying by 100, multiplying by 1,000, because you know that basically just scoots the um, decimal point over so many spaces. All right. I want to preserve some portion of this particular problem. I want to save one of the threes. So I need the space, I'll just erase this up here. If n is this 0 0.333 forever and ever and ever, and I basically want to just have one of these threes exist and the bunch of threes after it cancel out of existence, that would take multiplying this by 10. 10 times n would be this. It would be the effect of basically scooting over the decimal place one space, and then I would have this instead, 3, 3, 3 into infinity. Okay. That's mental math skill, multiplying any number by 10. This is the abbreviation for the number on the left side of equals. This is the actual number on the right side of equals, and this is the effect. Right. Now I'm going to subtract these things. If I subtract essentially n, which you can call 1 if you like, right? I'm just going to call it n, then as one grand problem, what you would have is this. The original number that was in green, now in red, 0 0.333 forever and ever and ever, situated directly underneath the incarnation of the number with the moved over decimal point, namely 10n. What this is going to accomplish is this. I am preserving the most interesting feature of this particular repeating decimal, which is at least one of the threes. But at the exact same time, remember when you do subtraction of decimals, you line up the decimal points. And you line up all the decimal places. If I subtract these, 
here, but let me do the exact same thing um, here. Green, I hate to use green. There's gonna be a lot of cancellation, right? Three minus three, pardon me, three minus zero, right off the bat is just three on this side of equals. If this is read as 10 minus one, what's 10 minus one? Just ignore the ends right now. They're like terms, you don't have to worry about that. Just pay attention to the, the numbers 10 and one. 10 minus one is just nine with an N attached to it for all intents and purposes. And then what's gonna happen to infinity, all right? Three minus three is zero. You could put a zero here, but it's optional. As I am often fond of saying, math people are lazy, sadly. They leave out ones and zeros and decimal points and positive signs. And the index of the square root also, right? When it's a convenience for them to do so. It would be a convenience in my case, in this case, not to put the zeros here. Just simply cancel these numbers out of existence and because of our our purposely rigging the system as such, this would go on into infinity. It would have to, we wouldn't even have to worry about it. It would just preserve that much of the pattern here. Okay, so we've basically erased infinity, we've eliminated it, and now we're left with this. We're left with this teeny tiny algebra equation. 9n, well you can read it as 9 times n because they're pressed together and it's implied that two things pressed together are being multiplied, is equal to 3. If I want to solve, <coughs> if I want to solve this equation algebraically, I'm going to perform opposite operations. What is the opposite of multiplying by 9? Divided by 9, right? The way that they imply that is by using a division ball like this, fraction style ball, and dividing by nine here, and then to make it legal, you do opposite operations, and to make it legal, you do it to both sides of the equal sign. Right? That's again, the statement from before. You can get away with murder in math, as long as you're consistent. Whatever little tweaks, changes that you make to the bottom of a fraction, do to the top of a fraction and it makes it perfectly legal. Same thing here. If I divide by nine here for the sake of a cancellation effect, that's fine. But do it to the opposite side simultaneously. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the number, the number is three ninths, right? Now you already know that 0.3333 is one third, but what is three ninths reduced? What is it simplified? Well, if you divide by three, which is the GCF best method, then this is a one sitting on top of three. This is slightly out of frame here. Three ninths is one third. Let's do a couple of these because it takes a little getting used to. say that you hypothetically had this 0 0.18 with the line, the bar notation over both digits. What does that really mean? It means that this is really 181818 into infinity. Right. Let's start out by calling it, even if it seems kind of superfluous and silly, you know, unnecessary extra. Let's call this n, right? n is a number. And then just duplicate 
um, what we have. 0 0.181818 with a bunch of ellipses. I like to do three iterations of whatever is repeating. Okay, remember the objective from before. We want to preserve the interesting pattern here, but we only need one example of it, not the whole thing, obviously. And we also want to eliminate infinity if we can help it. Now, to, to acquire or keep uh, that much of the pattern that represents the digits that, that are repeated, we're going to move not just one space in this case, we're going to need to move two spaces. So just keep one example of 18, these two, these two digits, pardon me. Now, what would it take? What would we have to multiply by to justify moving a digit, uh, pardon me, a decimal point from here to here, two spaces? You would need to multiply it by 100 to accomplish that, right? in which case you would have 18.181818. Okay. That's preserving. Um, one portion of the pattern, basically. Just multiplying by 100 makes it 18 and then the pattern into infinity. Now we need to destroy infinity, eliminate it. So what I do to accomplish that is I'm going to subtract that original n value, all right? So if n is this 0 0.181818 into infinity, put that back in a minute, then I have this grand subtraction problem. <laughs> and I am going to purposely write the number that is usually just neglected usually just implied that when you see a letter N that it is one, right? Just to do the subtraction on this side of the equals, I'm going to purposely put the one here. Right. Now I'm going to do it. What is 100 minus 1? 99. N. What is 18 minus 0? Or 8 minus 0 is 8 with a 1 drag down is the decimal points. These, in theory, would be on graph paper and all lined up nicely. And everything into infinity this way is canceled by everything into infinity this way. Systematically, each one of these subtracted would cancel out of existence, leaving just 18. Which is so cool, right? It is. I think so. Um, now, the algebra portion of the show here which is to move, to solve for n, you have to move the things away from it. So if there happens to be a 99 sitting here, I have to move it from here over to here where the number is. How do I accomplish that? Opposite operations. If this is really 99 pressed up against n is really 99 times n, to justify moving it is to divide by 99. And if you did it here, you're obligated to do it here. This would cancel out of existence by design. And then the end result would be this. N is equal to 18 over 99. Now you should always, as an afterthought, try to simplify. Right? And in this case, I'll, I'll use the GCF again. Right? I recognize the numbers 18 and 99 from multiplication tables that I have memorized. Right? Um, but at, in at any case, if you were to simply, if you were to take the time to figure out what the GCF is, we can guarantee that the end result is going to be a completely simplified fraction in one step rather than several steps. This is divisible by 9, and consistently divide this by 9. Right? 18 divided by 9 is 2. 99 divided by 9 is 11. 2 ninths is the original decimal of 0 0.1818181818. Right. If you want, if you never, you're always a little suspicious, it's good to be skeptical. 
divide with your calculator 2 by 11 in that order. Type 2 first, hit division, then hit 11. You will see this pattern on your screen. Okay. 18 over 99 as well. They're equivalent fractions. It's just that this is the preference because it's simplified. Let's do uh, one more situation where you have a repeating decimal, but it doesn't start immediately after the decimal point, but starts a little bit deeper, a little bit farther to the right. Suppose you had this. Suppose you had 0 0.83 and the bar was only above the 3. Right. Again, write it as even if it seems superfluous, even if it seems extra and unnecessary. Right. You're trying to craft an algebra problem. Right. Call this n as in number. Right. n is equal to 0 0.83. And then uh, write out just a couple of uh, repetitions of whatever the digit is that's repeating. So, 3, 3, you know, you don't have to do more than 3 of them, but, you know, you get the pattern in an obvious state of being. Okay, we want to preserve, right, uh, one example of each unique digit. And we also simultaneously want to delete um, infinity. So we are going to pull the same trick. We're going to basically move um, the decimal point. The question is, how much do we need to do it? The repeating pattern starts in the hundredth place. So if I want to accomplish basically getting the decimal from here to here, right, from here to here, that would preserve one of the threes, that would take multiplying by which? Times 10, times 100, or times 1,000? A hundred. So the incarnation of this, that would be a hundred n, that is a hundred times the number, would be this, 83.333 forever and ever and ever. Okay. This one is going to be a little bit more complicated than the last problem because we're going to end up having to consider how I'm going to delete out all of infinity, and it's going to be slightly off. All right. In the last problems, I just kept subtracting by 1n. In this case, because I need to basically have my 3s start here, and there's a 0 in theory to this location, All right, or something like that, I'm going to have to move the decimal to the position of 10n simultaneously. All right. So if I multiply by 10 n, the decimal point wouldn't go as far as 100. I do need that. But it would go that far. It would go from here to just in between 8 and 3. And I hate to use green, but here's what we would have. We would have an 8, and then we would have 3s into infinity. And you might get a little nervous and go, hey, wait a minute. I'll pull the fast one, Ziggler. Right. You're not going all the way. You're not preserving three here. We already did in the top blue instance here. We already have an example of the number where the three is preserved, that one single three. What I'm just trying to accomplish in this green case is I'm trying to rig the situation so that these all cancel out of existence. Right? The infinity goes away. And we're going to get stuck with, you know, whatever number we do down here. All right, let's do the subtraction now. 100 minus 10, in this case, is not going to produce 99 or 9 or anything like that. It's going to be 90 instead. 90N. Decimal points line up. 83 minus 8 is what? Well, here's my subtraction. All right, 13 minus 8 is 5. And then you drag down the 7. 75. Okay. Now we do our algebra. If I'm going to solve this 
teeny tiny one step algebraic equation, and it is understood it is 90 times n from the difference. But if I want to move this from here to here, I'm going to do the opposite of multiplying. The opposite of multiplying is dividing by 90. And again, you can only get away with this if you're consistent. So divide by 90 here as well. The 90s over here are going to strategically cancel out of existence, which means that you're going to be left with n is equal to 75 over 90. If, again, you had your calculator handy and you divided 75 by 90, you'll see the original pattern on your screen. We still ideally want to reduce this to the simplified fraction, completely simplified. So I'm going to take advantage of rules of divisibility again. Divisibility, sorry, I'm not talking correctly. I'm going to divide by the GCF. Um, the actual GCF would be 15, all right? which you may or not, may not know offhand, but I'm going to use just divisibility in this case, because it occurred to me to do that that way first. GCF would be ideal, but I know that this ends in a 5, this ends in a 0, so I can divide these by 5. They're divisible. 75 divided by 5 is 15. Right, 5 goes into 7 once, with 2 left over. Short division. 5 goes into 25 5 times. It's a little faint, right? Uh, okay. Green, don't fail me now. Okay. Uh, 90 is divisible by 5. 5 goes into 9 once, with 4 left over. 5 goes into 40 eight times. Okay. So we'd have that. Now, it just so happens that the end result is not simplified because I only used divisibility rules in this case. I should really ideally use a GCF. But these are something that would divide by 3. Some of the digits is 6. 6 can be divided by 3 nicely, so therefore 15 can. 18 is divisible by 3 because of the rule of divisibility for 3. 1 plus 8 is the sum, is 9. 9 certainly divides by 3, so therefore 18 also divisible by 3. It has to be, what do we do to the bottom, do to the top? 15 divided by 3 is 5. 18 divided by 3 is 6. 5 6 is this same pattern. 8, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, forever and ever and ever. Okay. All right. That's basically it. I'm at the nearly two hour mark here. All right. So let me just remind you of a couple of things. Um. Next week, we was on the 30th, Monday, we were supposed to have our test. Um, we can't obviously do that because I have no way of giving it to you, uh, proctoring it, or collecting it. So for the foreseeable future, um, on the days that we would have had tests, just assume we won't have a test on that day. All right. um, it's nice because then we can kind of relax a little bit. All right. Your grades in Canvas are all current. Um, I dropped, uh, I did record the last uh, quiz grade as I had promised I would. Um, just, there's my sister over here. See you later. This is, anyway, um, don't worry about the tests, all right? Just worry about doing your assignments in my lab because you need the practice, all right? We're going to really just learn math for the love of learning at this point, right? You do have grades established today, and if they ended the semester tomorrow, I could give you a grade very easily. Um, if they let us go back to school anytime soon, then we will pick up where we left off. I will continue periodically to record whatever the averages are in my lab, right? If you don't have a MyLab account or you need to update the software license, please do, right? It's really our only source of uh, material at this point, right? And you need the practice in theory and preparation of your practices exam. All right, so do that. Right. Anyhow, for homework, all right, you do section 5.3, part one, okay? There is no test number two next week. Right. You can't. Right. This is not, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> Anyhow, it takes the load off us, right, all of us, all right? Um, just
just make sure to do this assignment. You could do that naturally remotely because it was online to begin with. Okay. All right. Be safe, folks. All right. Thank you for listening. And I'll try to get this uploaded. Look at these split. Take care.